Now we're talking about her big hero objects. And Jeff Hester, what are they and what have you seen with the Hubble telescope? Well, uh, I'll back up a little bit and first start talking about why it is that star formation is such a, a fascinating question. When we look at stars forming, um, astronomers never get a chance to actually see stars forming. But what we can do instead is look out at different objects and catch them at different stages in the formation process and then use what we know of physics and of our, our local environment to put those together into a story, which is becoming a remarkably clean story, actually. And this is exciting because really what we're seeing here is what happened five billion years ago when our own sun and our own solar system came into being. And so when we look at what we're going to be looking at today, it's a bit of a time machine that lets us see into our own history and some of the why behind our own existence. We could look at the first graphic. Um, a very important piece of this story was discovered in the 1950s by two astronomers by the name of George Herbig and Guillermo Harrow. And what they found were jets of glowing gas, such as the jet here and the jet here, clumps of glowing gas, rather, moving rapidly through space. What we now understand is happening is that right about where the cross is now, there's a brand new star that's forming. Material is flowing away from that star in two jets, one in this direction and one in this direction. It's called a bipolar outflow. That material is streaming away from that forming star and then up in this area and down in this area, it's running into ambient material, the material that was around that star. This is a space telescope picture of an object called HH12, which is one of four different objects that we're going to see images of today. A nice thing about what we're going to see today, we're going to see images of four separate objects, and yet the story that's being told in those four separate objects is a common story. You put it all together and you start to get a clear picture that answers some fundamental questions about how it is that stars form. For example, we're going to see some data that shows us the immediate environment around a, a forming star, uh, the things that might lead to solar systems and such as that. We're going to see new information that tells us about the material flowing away from those stars, and in particular tells us that that material brings with it the history of what was happening with the star itself. And finally, we're going to see a story about how that material goes out and interacts with the surroundings of the star, which might be an important piece of answering the question of what makes stars the size that they are. If I could have the next graphic. This is an object called HH34. And this is a different object from the last one that we showed you. And what you see here again is right down at about this location, right at the tip of that little arrow shape, is where the star itself is. The light that you see right around that is light that's being reflected from the cloud and the disk from which that star is forming. Coming out away from that star is an exceedingly thin jet. And one of the new results that we'll be talking about today is the fact that that jet is so very, very thin right at its tip. It tells us it's coming from the star itself almost. That material then comes streaming out through interstellar space. And if you see each of these knots along here, they sort of look like a train of motorboats, each of which has its own little bow wave. And that's a very exciting new result. When astronomers first looked at these jets, they understood that they were clumpy. But many astronomers believed that those clumps were, in fact, due to a smooth flow in the jet that had some sort of funny internal structure in it. Uh, for those of you who've watched a space shuttle take off, you might notice that there are little diamond-shaped features behind the shuttle main engines. We now know that's not what's going on in these jets. That, in fact, each one of these knots is a separate little puff of material, burst of material that came off of the forming star. And we can look at those bursts and find out not only about the jet itself, but about the source. Finally, to, uh, to close up a few opening thoughts, we see jets in these forming stars, but the jets that we see in these forming stars are also very similar to the jets that astronomers see when they study quasi-stellar objects, when they study radio galaxies, when they study jets that cover millions of light years of interstellar space, and when they talk about massive black holes at the centers of galaxies. Here we're looking at the very same types of phenomena, but now close by where we can study them in more detail. OK, well, we've seen. Uh... Jeff Hester, we've seen a, at least four different Herbig-Harrow objects 
to, to the uninitiated like myself, they all look different. I suspect we'll see some more before we're done today. Is there any commonality in all of this? Is well, that's, that's really one of the exciting things about these data. Often in astronomy, we go and, and look at this object and say, wow, that's wild. And then we look at this object and say, wow, that's wild. But here we're looking at a number of different objects, and we're getting the same common picture out of all of them. It tells us that we're really seeing not special circumstances, but really we're seeing a picture of how it is that stars form. Uh, as a way of seeing that, Chris was just showing you a model of what's going on in HH30 with the disk and such as that. And if we could have the next graphic here, uh, this is exactly the same model that Chris was showing you for HH30 except this model has been turned on end a little bit. And so if you look at this model, what you see now is you see the jet coming out away from the star, very narrow at the end. You then see what appears to be kind of a conical reflection nebula here that's the top of the disk. And then you don't see the jet on the other side, because on the other side, the jet is in fact hiding behind uh, the material on the disk. When we look at HH34, which was the same object that we looked at before, we see a picture that looks very much like this model. If we could have that graphic, please. In HH34, keep the model that you just saw in mind and look at what we have here. Down at one end, the star itself is at this location, and we see kind of a conical reflection nebula, which is exactly what we saw in that model of HH30 when we turned it on end. We then see the jet coming out, again, very, very thin right down at the tip and expanding somewhat as it moves out through interstellar space, again, just as we saw in the model of HH30. And finally, we see the difference between this model and HH30 is that there's no jet here on the other side. It's actually there, it's just that we can't see it because it's hiding behind that very dense disk from which the star itself is forming. While this picture is up, the other thing that I'll talk about that's common between these observations is the picture that we're getting of these knots. Again, I mentioned in my opening comments that many astronomers thought for a long time that just a smooth flow of material was coming out from the star and that the knots that they saw from the ground were things that were kind of happening inside that smooth flow of material. Here, though, we clearly see, for example, here a clump with its own little bow wave, or here a clump with its own little bow wave. And if you look at all of the jets that we see today, you get that same basic picture, that these are bursts that are happening, that, that the star does something and it spits out material. And so these bursts are not talking as, telling us something about you know, some esoteric piece of gas dynamics that happens as jets travel through interstellar space. Instead, it's telling us that stars, when they form, for reasons that are not entirely clear to us yet, stars, when they form from the very innermost part of that disk in the star itself, are episodic. They do something for a while, and then they go burst, and they send out a burst of material. And understanding the physics of why that happens is going to be something that any successful model of star formation is going to have to come to grips with. I think we want to look into the physics a little and uh, ask Jeff Hester and John Morse, you know, what do you think makes these things come out episodically? And, and if you want to get into the kinks, tell us about that too. Well, the, the physics is the right word. The, you know, one of the very most exciting things about this is that we're finally getting a close enough look at what's going on that we can start doing some physics. For some years, people have been calculating models, using computers to do simulations of what should be happening in these jets. And they've been calculating these models, and we all go off to meetings and look at them and say, oh, that's very pretty. But then we've been turning to our data. And our data have been of such a quality that we just couldn't do a real comparison between what we were seeing in the models and between what we were seeing in, in the real universe. Theory out had there. more detail than the pictures. Theory yes. had more detail than the pictures. The exciting thing here is that we're finally actually able to see the real objects well enough to start doing that comparison. Uh, we have a simulation here, in fact. This is a simulation that was carried out by uh, Jim Stone, who's at the University of Maryland. And what he did is calculate what happens when a jet, a pulsed jet, consisting of lots of little bursts, comes flying out into the surrounding interstellar gas. And what you see here, these individual, if I could have the cursor on, please. The little motorboats. The little motorboats, exactly. These individual knots are the pulses that are coming out from the source. 
And you see that as they move along, each one has its own little bow wave, just like a motorboat has its little bow wave, which is exactly the kind of structure that we're seeing when, when we're looking at these jets. And so all you have to do, it was when we got these data, it was really exciting because we had seen these models for the past several years. And when you first looked at the Hubble Space Telescope images of these jets, it was like saying, wow, I've seen that picture before, except it wasn't a picture of something in space, really. Instead, it was a picture of somebody's calculation of what should be in space. And that's the kind of thing that when it happens for an astronomer, it's really very, very exciting, because it tells you just almost instantly that there's something that now you understand that before you didn't. Another piece of that model that you just saw was the individual blobs of gas coming along and running into the bow wave at the end. So this material was coming along and one knot hit smack, and then the next knot caught up with it and smack over and over again. Well, when you look at another object, uh, this is a HH1, if I could have the next graphic, please. Another very exciting thing was that we saw exactly the same phenomena there. This is when, another Hubble Space Telescope image? This is image another there. Hubble Space Telescope image. This is, in fact, a blow up of the first Hubble Space Telescope image that I showed you. And if I could have the graphic and the, and the cursor again, please. What you're seeing here is the jet is coming in from this direction, and it's smacking into the interstellar gas right here. And so these individual pulses are coming in over and over again. Wham, wham, wham. And what we saw here that was really fascinating is that right up here at the very front of this is the bow wave of one of those pulses. And then immediately behind it, coming right up on its wake, is the bow wave of another one of those pulses. And so not only are we getting to see the detailed physics of the jet itself and speculate about what that jet tells us about the star and the star formation, we're also getting to look at the other end of it and seeing the effects of these individual pulses coming in and one after the other running into the clouds of interstellar gas that surround this object. Okay. So it's really very exciting stuff. One of the exciting things is as we've been getting ready for this presentation in the last couple of days and we've been arguing among ourselves what it means. There are all manner of models that you can come up with. Um, Tell us one or two. Okay, you look, for example, if you look at the time scales for these pulses, they range anywhere from a few years to a few tens of years. And that's the same kind of time that it takes, say, for a large planet to orbit around the star, or the kind of time that it takes for two stars to orbit around each other. But it's also the kind of time that it takes, say, for the sun's magnetic field to change directions. And we know that there's a good chance that these disks, or that these disks and jets uh, are strongly magnetic and that that's a, a major part of it. Um, lots of other speculation. And again, we're not giving you answers today, but instead we're saying that there's lots of neat stuff in here. And before we really say that we understand star formation, uh, we're going to have to say that we understand all these phenomena that we're speculating about.